Michael Caine is Harry Palmer, the working class 007. Let's go back to the mid 60s. British kitchen sink movies have been quite a thing since the beginning of the 60s with films like this Sporting Life, Saturday Night, Sunday Morning, The Loneliness of the Long Distant Runner and many others. James Bond with uh, Sean Connery had become a big hit since I think 62 when Dr No came out. So by 1965 up popped Michael Caine as Harry Palmer starring in movies from the books written by a guy called Len Dayton. So what's so special about this Harry Palmer? Well the striking thing is that he's a working class spy. He's done something dodgy when he was in the army, something in Germany. We don't know exactly what it is because he don't go into details, but it's revealed that he's given a choice. You go to jail or you go work for MI5. Now, I think it's MI5 he's working for, not MI6, uh, which James Bond works for. MI5 deals more with homeland security and MI6 deals more with foreign matters but it seems a bit that both cross over so we think he's working for MI5 he's not very happy about it but he's pretty much been blackmailed now the second most notable thing about this character Harry Palmer is his thick horn rimmed glasses very rare to have a protagonist and a bit of a hero although he's a bit of an anti-hero too because he's kind of sullen but he's wearing these thick glasses and we see when he's not wearing them that he's got very bad vision indeed we see at the start of the movie that he's got his own sophisticated way of doing things because he's got a coffee blender Wow, a coffee blender, coffee grinder, whatever it is. I'm not much of a coffee man myself, uh, mostly just instant. But this was quite an unusual thing. Another thing we notice about him a bit later is that he's really into cooking. So these things together, the glasses, the cooking and the coffee, He's kind of mark him out to be, yeah, he's working class, but he's not thick. He's not, not just thick. A working class people were usually portrayed as being a bit stupid. Yeah, okay, they've got some common sense, but they tend to be background characters or they'll, they'll comment on something sometimes, but you don't get working class people in British cinema being, uh, having any kind of taste, you know? above their, you know, taste in what football team they support. So he does have this sophisticated edge to him and this was, as I said, very novel back in its day. But we see that he's also quite into gambling, especially horse racing, so like a lot of people, he buys the daily paper and he marks out what horses he's going to bet on that day so that's that's a real kind of uh it's not just a working class trait but a lot of working class guys do that and always have done and still do it today horse racing is a is a big thing in britain so there were like three movies made from 1965 to 1967 with harry palmer based on the len dayton books there's a couple of films in the 90s as well, and I haven't really looked at them. I, I did once try and watch one of them, and it didn't really grab me. So let's do the original trilogy, starting with the Ipcress file, then going on to Funeral in Berlin, and finishing off with the rather outlandish and strange Billion Dollar Brain. Well... We see Michael Caine getting up, doing his coffee thing, and uh, this is the Ipcrest file we're looking at, first movie, and then we see him walking, 
and then we see him going into the office of his uh, superior who is wonderfully played by a guy called Guy Dolman who is actually a New Zealander but comes across as a really British kind of upper class kind of guy he goes into his office and uh, this is called Colonel Ross Guy Dolman Colonel Ross so uh, Colonel Ross sitting there he's got this great office right next to Trafalgar Square which you notice in those days was full of pigeons and he's throwing seeds out his window for these pigeons back in those days Trafalgar Square was famous for its pigeons we used to go there we could buy seed and stuff excuse the motorbikes um, I'm in a kind of place where it's a bit noisy nothing much I can do about it for now anyway in those days we used to go to Trafalgar Square buy some seeds and the pigeons used to sit on us you know we'd hold out our hands full of seeds and the pigeons would sit on our heads and it was all really groovy that was before we decided that pigeons are a, a big menace they're like a flying rats my dad used to call them and uh, we got rid of them all except you can't get rid of them all because like rats they uh, keep coming back but Trafalgar Square is not like it once was Colonel Ross informs Harry Palmer that these scientists are going missing and he's got to go and find out what's going on and get this famous scientist back from whoever's kidnapped him and to do this he's uh, transferred to a different department with a kind of a major Dolby in charge of it. Dolby informs Palmer that he's not going to take his insolence or his insubordination and he'll crack right down on him. And Michael Caine always gives this kind of a deadpan, kind of slightly cynical, slightly surly kind of uh, look. Palmer meets the Dolby's team and uh, immediately notices a pretty woman and uh, he's got an eye for the ladies so he sits right next to her during the briefing and before you can say Jack Robinson she's back at his place and he's cooking her what he says will be the best meal of her life. Palmer's immediately on the case and uh, He's soon tracking down the uh, missing scientist to a warehouse and he organises a big raid but there's no one there and Dolby's like really cheesed off with him but Palmer does find a, a tape, a strange kind of tape in the old wood burning stove in this warehouse and they take this tape back and try and play it and it's all like very 60s woo 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 bit Manchurian candidate kind of stuff on this tape and they figure out that Ipcrest kind of means some kind of psychological programming thing on his day off uh, if they get days off I guess they do Palmer shopping in his local early form of supermarket and he runs into Colonel Ross who wants Palmer to inform on Dolby and tell him all about the Ipcrest file but Palmer says no mate uh, I ain't doing that it's not kosher but they do discuss what what are the best uh, canned mushrooms in the supermarket and Palmer does help Mr Ross Colonel Ross in fact to uh, choose the right kind of foodstuffs because we know Harry Palmer is a real uh, connoisseur of the old grub thing Palmer's soon back on the case and before you can say uh, Jack Robinson for the second time uh, he's made a deal to get the uh, missing scientist back and swap some money with these kind of uh, nasty people whoever they might be we don't know who they might be at the moment so they arrange this uh, handover and they get the scientist back but all the time Harry's been followed by the American Secret Service and during the handover one of them appears but they don't know who he is so they open fire and there's a bit of argy-bargy and suddenly the American agent's been shot dead by Palmer 
And Dolby's like, congratulations, mate, you, you just shot an American agent. Meantime, Palmer's mate, who's helped him work out what the Ipcrest file means, he's been killed in his car. And before you know what's going on, a second American agent who's sent to uh, kind of uh, find out what Palmer's all about, he's found dead in Harry Palmer's uh, flat. So Harry Palmer gets in touch with Dolby and he's like, what's going on, man? I'm being set up here, I need your help. And meantime, also, the scientist they got back has completely gone gaga. And it seems like he was put through some kind of brainwashing, so he's no use to no one. Now Harry Palmer set up with a second killing. So uh, Dolby tells him to hightail it out of the place and he'll deal with it. But, but before you know where we are, and you say Jack Robinson for the third bloody time, I don't know why I keep saying that, but I do, uh, what's happened is Palmer wakes up in a strange kind of cell, and he's kept in this cell for days and days, eating a bit of bread and water. And then they drag him out, and it's the bad guys who had the scientist, and they say that uh, he's in Albania. And it's like, oh my God, I'm in Albania. And Albania weren't a pleasant place back in the 60s. It's probably not a pleasant place now. I don't know. I haven't been there. But then he's put through all this brainwashing Manchurian candidate kind of stuff, sit, sitting in front of a screen. And this guy's telling him to obey my voice. You must do what I say. But Palmer keeps himself straight by hurting his hand in the uh, arm, what you call them, arm restraints, and he's digging into his own hand to feel the pain, and it's all bloody, and he won't stop saying his real name, but eventually he kind of uh, gets it, and he starts saying, oh, yeah, right, OK, I'll obey you. I don't know who I am, but it's all bullshit. So when the guards come to get him the next time, he gives him a good old punch because he's pretty good at fighting. Uh, glasses on or off, uh, he's a pre pretty good fighter, so he manages to escape and he gets over the wall. And lo and behold, what does he see? A London bus, and he's been in London all the time. So he gets himself to a phone box and he phones Dolby and it's like, oh, all this shit's happening, what do I do? And Dolby's like, follow my voice and uh, meet me in uh, this warehouse place. So Palmer goes over there and uh, someone calls Ross too, Colonel Ross. And I don't know, I can't remember if that's Michael Caine as Harry Palmer or Dolby or someone, but now he's got both of them in this warehouse. He's got Major Dolby and he's got Colonel Ross and he's like, you know, I know what's going on here. Something's going on, someone's bent, someone's not straight. I guess that's what bent means, not straight. Someone's informing, someone's involved, and it's one of you two, I think. So he's got a gun on, on them both, and we see what happens then. Who is it? Is it Dolby, or is it Colonel Ross? But you'll have to watch the movie to find out, because I'm not going to tell you. But yeah, it's a great slice of uh, 60s uh, spy thriller stuff. And uh, yeah, so we've done The Ipcrest File, which was one of my dad's favourite movies. And my dad, my dad was uh, very into the spy Cold War thing and always reading. Uh, my friends at school used to call him the alco alcoholic bookworm because he was always reading and he was always down the pub. But he wasn't usually down the pub reading. But, uh, and he wasn't usually, he wasn't really an alcoholic as such. But he read a lot of books and got me into books. And uh, my dad really identified with that character, Harry Palmer. Maybe it was the guy that my dad had loved to have been. And he also had terrible eyesight and thick glasses himself. So, uh, that pretty much done it for my dad and Michael Caine was an original working class boy from South London uh, he also went to school in East London uh, Hackney Downs School which has changed its name now it's an academy but uh, that was just across from me so uh, Harry, uh, Harry Palmer Michael Caine really 
was the authentic working class boy. And uh, that came across. Uh, no mockney was he or is he to this day. And so uh, that's the Ipcrest file and we'll move on to the next movie. So let's move on to the second movie, movie in the uh, Harry Palmer trilogy. Uh, it's called Funeral in Berlin. I think it's probably 66, 1966. And we start off with some great shots of the Berlin Wall and No Man's Land. And that brought back some memories for me because I once went across the Berlin Wall. There was a train line went west to east, east to west. And uh, for family reasons, I was on a train, used to, maybe you still can, used to get a train all the way from Liverpool Street Station in London to the Hook of Holland. Uh, via Harwich docks and then at the Hook of Holland there was this long train and bits of it were western like Dutch bits and West German bits and then there were some really dodgy carriages uh, very army like carriages which were for the eastern block and the train went all the way to Moscow maybe it still does uh, but I remember oh it's a long story but I remember being stuck they used to stop the train in no man's land uh, and there were East German soldiers I guess they were because they all had rifles and searched that train from top to bottom uh, underneath the train on top of the train they were going everywhere and I was like it was the middle of the night and I was up and I was I was a very young man then and looking across no man's land and looking from the west side to the east side and I really got the contrast and stuff so I'm one of those people that managed to go across the Berlin Wall during the uh, Soviet times anyway we get this shot and uh, there's some workers on the eastern side and uh, suddenly a big uh, kind of metal container comes over on a crane from the west and a guy makes a break for it jumps in this big container the East German border guards open up on it and it whisks him up in the air and over to the other side and uh, everyone on the other side cheers and he gets out of the container and uh, gets escorted away and that's how the movie starts. Then we get Palmer jumping off the uh, platform of a bus in London which is great because those buses used to have the old route master buses had those platforms you could jump on and jump off without those kind of sliding door things you've got now where there's no chance sometimes people would jump off the bus a little bit too early and have to run a few steps and would run straight into a lamppost or the bus stop and that was always very amusing uh, to see but Harry Palmer's too cool for that and he jumps off the bus and uh, we see he's in the suburbs and uh, he's at a house and it's Colonel Ross we see again who's absolutely brilliant and he's in his garden and he starts talking about how he how he likes weeds and how the flowers get in the way of his weeds uh, which is uh, he's, a bit, he's a little bit eccentric that Colonel Ross not madcap but sort of quietly eccentric and uh, he tells uh, Palmer that he's got to go over to East Germany because a KGB colonel wants a defect and he's going to have to help him to defect, probably using the same people that got that guy out that we saw in the beginning. Anyway, Palmer uh, goes off and sees the sort of MI5 forger guy or whatever and gets his papers and he's called Edmund Dolph, which he he doesn't like at all because he, he wants to be called, what is it, not Rock Hudson, <laughs> something like that. Rock, Rock something, Rock Cowboy, I can't remember. Anyway, uh, he's given these papers by this rather curious little man and then he's off to Germany and uh, he gets stopped at the airport and he's told to open his luggage and in that luggage is a load of uh, women's lingerie which you think, aye aye, he's got uh, big plans for his trip over there but turns out his cover is as a uh, salesman, underwear salesman and they've got this whole set up over there with uh, 
a whole business selling lingerie, but really it's MI5 or MI6 or whatever it is. And uh, his mate picks him up from the airport and he knows he's a German guy and he knows him. We call him his mate. And uh, I can't remember his name. And uh, they talk a bit about the shenanigans they had with the Nafi. The Nafi was the, still is, the sort of supplier of the army of their beer and cigarettes and food and all that sort of stuff. And we reckon, I reckon, not we, because I'm just an I, um, I reckon that his original crime which got him into this uh, spy business was something to do with a naffy in Germany and selling stuff to the German army, something like that. Anyway, there have been cohorts before and this German guy's got a nice car and off they go very happily to try and arrange to find the guys that will smuggle the KGB officer over to the west. So Harry gets himself into the east. Uh, not sure how, but it's all legitimate. And uh, meets up with uh, Colonel Stock, the KGB guy, who's supposed to defect, but Harry don't believe him. Colonel Stock's a brilliant, brilliant character. He's in this movie and the next movie. Uh, Colonel Stock played by a guy called Oscar Homoika who was actually Austrian guy, and he does a very, very good KGB officer. I mean, I've never met a KGB officer, not that I know of, but this guy's uh, quite elderly, well, in his 60s, late 60s, he looks like, and he's very, very jolly, and he calls Harry English all the time, and uh, he's a very affable kind of KGB guy. He's the kind of KGB guy that we'd all love to meet, you know. Not that we'd love to meet many of them, but if you had to, it would be a character like him. Back in West Berlin, Harry meets this rather glamorous and beautiful young lady, and they end up sharing a cab, going back to her place, but he has a look around, and there's something shady going on in her apartment, and she's an Israeli, and he doesn't mind, but he, does, he sort of suspects her, so he sets her up, he meets this... Uh, policeman in West Germany he knows and through that finds a housebreaker that he used to know. See he's very dodgy is Harry, he knows all these characters, forgers, housebreakers, all kinds of stuff and the German policeman's a bit cheesed off about all this being used to find all these criminals. Anyway, he robs this girl's house and blah blah blah. Anyway, that's that bit. So she robs his house, he robs her house. It's obvious she's some kind of agent. But anyway, they get on like a house on fire. Why not? Now he has to go back to London and get all his papers because the KGB guy, Colonel Stock, won't defect unless he's got all the right things in place. He needs What they need to get him out is the identity of a... East or West German, I can't remember, West German person. So he goes back, meets the funny old forger MI5 guy, and he gets these papers for this uh, German guy uh, that's dead. So he takes them back to Germany. And he, he meets up with the guys that are going to get the KGB guy out and they arrange everything and everything looks like it's going to go well to get the KGB colonel out of the country. But Harry's all perplexed because uh, the identity of this de dead guy is Paul Von Brown or something. And he's found uh, something in the girl's safe that he had robbed with the same name on it and he's like, why, why is this... Why have we got the identity of this guy who's dead and now i found something with the same guy's identity on it. What's going on? But no one's going to tell him. Anyway, it's very uh, clever the way they get this guy out is they've got a dead guy. That, well, they kill a guy and they put him in a coffin and all the paperwork's done because they've got all this forged paperwork and then 
the hearse takes this dead body from the east and then they exchange somewhere secretly and they've got a copy of the same hearse and they just exchange papers and then the original hearse goes into a garage and hides away and the other hearse goes over and we presume it's got the KGB guy in the coffin and then they do the exchange on the bridge and they pay this old lady to be a mourner and pretend she's the wife of this guy that's dead and then they get to the warehouse where they're going to do the exchange of money and get the KGB guy but it turns out and it's actually the leader of the guys that get the people out of the east that's in the coffin and he's been murdered. So that was Colonel, what's his name, Colonel, I keep forgetting, Colonel Stock who's arranged all that and it's all been a big bluff to kill the guy that keeps getting people out of the east into the west. But Harry, mate, Harry's mate is there and he's a bit duplicitous and he gives Harry a big blow from behind and we don't know what's going on and the guys that work for the guy that's dead they grab the money but they don't grab the envelope with all the papers of this Paul Von Brown guy or whatever his name is and that's what this the German guy that Harry's mate really wants they want he wants the papers but when the guys who smuggle the smuggler guys get out of the way suddenly the girl turns up uh, the Israeli girl, her uh, name's Sam, with a couple of guys with machine guns and they grab the papers and they take off and then the German guy, Harry's mate, pretends that he didn't hit him and he doesn't know what's going on and the papers have gone and God knows what. So what happens then is Colonel Ross ends up coming over because Harry's lost all the money and he's lost all the papers and uh, Ross don't like this German guy and it turns out Harry's mate the German guy is a bit of a dodgy character himself and uh, Ross tells Harry he's no use to us anymore kill him but Harry's like uh, I'm not killing anyone in cold blood so Ross says well just provoke him then and then kill him and Harry's not looking very happy about it but he takes his mate off and Ross has told him a few things about what his German mate's done and Harry's not happy about that but I'm not going to tell you what it is but instead of killing him he takes him into the forest and just says look you, you're too dodgy get the hell out and hide just get to the east or something just disappear, get out of my face and he, his German mate's like okay, thanks Harry, that's cool but he don't disappear. He ends up in a museum uh, in West Germany. And who's he meeting? He's meeting a dodgy forger guy from MI5. So what's going on there? Well, it turns out that the papers, uh, which the German guy manages to get back of the Israeli guys by killing one of them, and turn out to be forgeries. And the fact is that Harry had a forger friend that he got from his policeman mate in West Germany and he's forged those papers so Harry's still got the real papers. So the MI5 forger guy goes round to Harry's place and says Colonel Ross wants me to take the real papers back. But Harry don't believe him and he gives him a right clobber in, in the toilet and uh, it turns out that, that this Paul Von Braun or whatever his name is, he's some kind of a Nazi criminal and he's got all these this money and jewellery locked in a Swiss bank account and he, Harry's German mate and the MI5 forger guy want to get their hands on it. So Harry tells the MI5 forger guy that to go and meet his German mate and he'll follow him, take the real papers with him so they end up by the wall and this uh, German, Harry's German mate's got contacts in the wall and they're opening a little bit of the wall to let him through and he's going to get through with these papers and use these papers to get the money from Switzerland but him and Harry have a bit of a confrontation and the MI5 forger guy don't really do very well out of it and he snuffs it 
well he don't just snuff it he's knifed which isn't very nice and then Harry and the German guy are having a bit of an argy bargy and then the Israeli girl Sam turns up with her cohorts and everything gets crazy and uh, then it ends but I won't tell you how it ends because you'll have to see it uh, I reckon Funeral in Berlin is the best of the three movies actually I think it's a really good movie uh, stands up quite well okay it's a bit dated but um, it's got a great plot to it and uh, it twists and turns one thing I do notice though in the Ipcrest file and funeral in Berlin they kind of give away what's going to happen or who's guilty before the end um, so like we know what's going on more than Harry knows what's going on but I guess that's a plot device that's sometimes used, isn't it? Like in horror movies where we know the killer's lurking outside, but the person inside the house don't know that the killer's lurking outside, trying to look for a way in. We do learn, though, that uh, the pigeons never come to eat Colonel Ross's food. And we also learn that Harry wants uh, some extra money to buy a car and he's always asking for extra money, a pay rise, or can I have a loan for a car? And Ross is always, well, we see. And Ross says to him, yeah, OK, you can have that money for the car. But Harry looks at him and says, uh, actually, I'd rather walk, which is uh, brilliant. OK, cool. And this is where we get the scene of Harry walking across Trafalgar Square as the camera pulls back. Um, at the end of the movie great shot where he's walking along looks like the public don't know that they're being filmed at the time so it's really naturalistic great ending okay done so here we are with the third movie in the original trilogy of Harry Palmer and it's called The Billion Dollar Brain another Len Dayton book produced by Harry Saltzman who interestingly used to uh produced the original James Bond movies and for some reason produced these too although they're a very different kettle of fish uh, and uh, that was that's cool but this movie really loses its way it's a bit kitsch um, it's a bit it's a bit over the top it's a bit like Austin Powers uh, you know it's a bit Mike Myers and apparently Austin Powers, the idea was partly uh, inspired by the Harry Palmer movies. And in fact, uh, Michael Caine is in one of these movies, I think Goldmember. Great movies, and there's always room for spoofs. But, you know, we're talking about back in the 60s and what this meant in those days. Not really the spoofs that came later. And I think if... Mike Myers got the idea from Mary Palmer. It was probably this movie, Billion Dollar Brain, where it's completely over the top. Um, it's very sort of uh, kitsch, kind of uh, James Bondy with the super villain Doctor Evil type in it. But uh, let's go through it briefly anyway. I, sh I should mention it was directed by Ken Russell, and I think that's the mistake that was made. Um, I think of Michael Caine's suggestion. Now, don't get me wrong, Ken Russell was a, a visionary filmmaker, a tremendous filmmaker. My favourite film of his is The Devils. Um, I can't remember who it stars now. Oliver Reed and, uh, oh, I've forgotten her name, but uh, a famous actress of, of <laughs> ill repute, or not, as the case may be. But anyway... That, I think, was the mistake. He wasn't really suited for this kind of uh, kind of realistic kind of feel to the Harry Palmer movies, the kind of kitchen sink thing. Uh, I don't think Ken, that was Ken Russell's thing, really. Uh, so this movie goes all over the place. It starts off late at night in London with a number 73 bus going to Stoke Newington, coming past, and... Uh, I know that bus very, very well, and it's still running today. And so that, that's, that's great, the way it starts. I'm always happy to see a 73 bus. 
uh, it, it appears in quite a lot of movies. One day I should go through oh, a lot of movies made in London, see how many times I can see a 73 bus, because it goes through quite a lot of the heart of London, especially the West End, going round to North London. The bus goes past a CD bit of the West End and uh, up there is a HP detective, Harry Palmer detec detective office and we see a man in a bowler hat um, going in there late at night and this guy gains entry, we don't know who he is and he's searching about. It's obviously Harry Palmer has left MI5 or MI6 or MI7 <laughs> if it exists and he's working on his own and this guy's going through his files and it, it's all sort of seedy kind of uh, divorce cases and there's old food left lying around which is really not Harry Palmer's style as we know he's, he, he's, he's, he's a cordon bleu that's the word, a cordon bleu so why would he leave all this shitty food lying around and there's like you know, posters of semi-naked women and it's all very gross and then while this guy's searching he picks up a old pack of cornflakes and then Harry Palmer arrives with his gun and he's like, put your hands up, you're under arrest and the guy puts his hands up and all the cornflakes fall on the floor and it turns out, who is it? It's Colonel Ross and Colonel Ross wants Harry back in the organisation but Harry reckons that's not going to happen unless you send two big guys round and force me to so Colonel Ross kind of leaves as all this is going on Harry receives a parcel and uh, when Ross has gone he gets a phone call from like a machine voice thing telling him to uh, open the parcel it's got money in it and a key for a lock up uh, in an airport, uh, probably Heathrow, but they call it West London Terminal. Maybe it used to be called that before it was called Heathrow. I, I can't remember. I don't think so. But anyway, that's the way that goes. And uh, so Harry Palmer's asking this machine what's going on, but the machine's just saying, get the parcel, get the money, and receive your instructions. So he goes to the uh, airport and he finds in the uh, lockup that it's like a flask so he's like tries to open it but he can't just a regular kind of coffee flask thing and uh, so he runs off really quickly jumps in a cab uh, in front of everybody in the uh, cab rank and flies off to like a, a shoe shop and it, it, apparently these shoe shops had a kind of a kind of like almost like an x-ray thing where you could look at your feet through this device and uh, see how your bones were doing I guess I don't know but he looks at this flask in one of them and it's got eggs in it and he says what well, eggs and uh, yeah eggs so uh, he goes back to the terminal and uh, he's instructed in his instructions flight to Helsinki so he flies to Helsinki and then he goes to a meeting place and this glamorous woman with a furry hat turns up and she wants the flask but he don't give her the flask he wants to see who it is who's instructing him and she takes him to this uh, kind of what you call it kind of sauna place and he meets an old mate there and his old mate's pretending to be this Dr. Karner, but uh, he's not really Dr. Karner, and he wants uh, Michael Kane to work for him, so why not, and what are the eggs for? Well, you know, we're not really going to tell you at this stage what the eggs are. But Harry's too canny, and he finds the real doctor, but the real doctor's dead as a dodo, so Harry tries to get the hell out of there, but he can't get out of there because what happens? Ro Ross turns up, Colonel Ross turns up in a car, drives Harry to the nearest police station and says, look, if you don't work for me, I'll tell them you killed that doctor and you'll be locked up over here for ages and ages. So Harry's like, yeah, oh, man, you did it to me again. So he has to go to work for Ross and Ross wants the flask back with the eggs. Harry wants a pay rise for doing this, but Ross, again, is a bit stalling on the old pay rise thing, so it's like, see how it goes. So Harry pretends to go back to work with his old mate, who turns out to be Carl Malden, which is a great actor, fantastic nose. 
Anyway, Carl Morden shows him this machine thing uh, and he's getting instructions from this machine thing and the machine thing tells Carl Morden to shoot the bird that, uh, that Harry Palmer had just met who tends to be going out with, the, with Carl Morden. So what's going on there? But Carl Morden don't carry out the instructions so the girl's still alive and everything's kosher. But then while Harry's in his hotel room, who turns up? Colonel Stock, our affable KGB guy, pretending to be a waiter, room service. Anyway, they have a good old chat and a good drink, and uh, our, our KGB man always talks about the communism and the revolution and how he once touched Lenin and all this kind of stuff, and tells Harry, don't get involved with all this. You don't know what you're getting involved with. Get out of here, English. But of course, Harry don't, so now he's with Carl Morden and some uh, scientist -y kind of guy, and he finds out the secret of the eggs, and the eggs are full of nasty viruses, and we don't know why, and then Carl Morden tells Harry Palmer he's got to go on a mission and uh, to these renegade kind of revolutionary types, and he's got to record them doing some heist or something and record some documents uh, because they're going to start a revolution in Latvia that's going to bring down the whole Soviet system, apparently. So uh, Michael Caine goes off there and they're a right ragtag bunch, it turns out to be, and they do a bit of a heist and uh, they get some stuff off the Russians and he photographs some documents and then the Russians come and there's a lot of shooting, people dying and Harry runs away. Uh, into the forest, but he gets clobbered by a load of Cossacks on horses. Uh, I guess they're Cossacks because they've got horses, but who knows? And then he wakes up uh, and uh, underneath a pile of dead, and the, the dead are like uh, all the partisan types he had just been hanging out with. But he's alive, and he gets up, and they're in this like strange room place. They're all in a big bath. I mean, it's ridiculous. But anyway. Uh, what happens then? A load of guys come in and he thinks they're going to duff him up, but they cleaned him up, and then next thing he knows, he's back with Colonel Stock again. Colonel Stock, and I keep forgetting the name, and it's a very short name. And uh, yeah, Colonel Stock says, Right, we've got the scientist guy here. With the, he ain't got the eggs, but uh, who's got the eggs? We don't know who's got the eggs. Maybe we've got the eggs. Maybe you've got the eggs. Maybe the girl's got the eggs. Maybe Carl Morden's got the eggs. Uh, they're going to kill this scientist guy, but he knocks himself off before they can get to him. And Colonel Stock's a bit pissed off because he thought the guy deserves to suffer more than he ended up suffering. But what the hell anyway? And then he gives Harry Palmer a ticket and says, here you go, go on, get out of here. It's nothing to do with you. But of, but of course, Harry don't get out there. And then before we know where we are, he's he's trying to have it off with this uh, woman or she's seducing him or whatever, but she was going to stab him with a hat pin or some hair pin or a big hat pin. Hat pin must be a hat pin. But Harry's too quick for her and there's a bit of fighting goes on with him and the bird, but then he locks her in a room and he goes out and he's got a gun on Carl Morden and he's like, this, this has gone far enough. What's going on? Give me the eggs, man. But Morden makes a deal with Harry Palmer and they're going to split the, the money they can sell the eggs for, apparently. But then the machine-type thingy tells him they've got to go to America, Texas, to see the uh, general, the general, whoever he is. So they end up over in Texas and there's a load of barn dancing going on. There's a big place and there's a, symbols around that look a bit like a German eagle or a Roman eagle without the eagle just the wings uh, and a strange symbol and there's this mad general who puts me in mind of the who was he a major general or something in dr strange love you know who keeps talking about our, our, our bodily fluids and he's completely mad and going to start a war and this general turns out to be 
barking mad and he's like doing these speeches and he's all grimacy and he's going on about communism and he's going to take over, not take over the world, he's kind of Dr. Evil, isn't he? And he's, here he is, you can see his face, he's all gesticulating, he's a bit over the top, he's too over the top for me. But anyway, he seems to like Harry and... Uh, Harry gets introduced to the billion dollar brain and it's all like, uh, well, all that equipment they got there, you could probably do that on my laptop right now, but that's the way things were with the spinny things going round and round and all the technicians running up and down and yeah, so this general guy's going to start a revolution in Latvia and then uh, the whole of communism's going to suddenly collapse and Harry Palmer thinks he's nuts, and he is nuts, so uh, there you go. But then the general gets information that Harry's been like close to this uh, Colonel Stock guy, the, the KGB, affable KGB funny bloke, and uh, yeah, so he's going to shoot Harry, but Harry says, hey, you don't want to shoot me, because I know Carl Morden is hasn't really got a load of uh, spies and revolutionaries out there like you think he has and uh, also he didn't kill the girl and he's going to fake that and then the general looks on his TV monitoring thing and he sees Carl Morden faking all the they used to use those computer cards in those days didn't they and that he's ripped up a load and he's got his own ones to cover the fact that he didn't kill the girl so the general stops Harry from being killed. He well, doesn't kill him. He was going to kill him, but now Harry says, "I'll get, I'll get Carl Morden back." Because by now Carl Morden's doing a Lego. He's got it, out, got out of this, whatever it is, billion-dollar brain place, and he's off. So Harry goes back to Helsinki to find Carl Morden, who magically has been able to get away from Texas and transport himself over to Helsinki in the blink of an eye. And then Sir Harry's arrived on one of the general's ships and uh, he goes looking for him. But it turns out the girl involved is a, a Russian agent and she's got the eggs and her and Carl Morden get on a train going to uh, Moscow. But uh, Harry Palmer's in hot pursuit with two cowboy blokes from Texas. And... Uh, they, they lose the train, they, they're too late to get the train, so they get a car, Harry and his comrades get this car and they chase this train all through these icy roads. I mean, it don't look much of a car, but it must be really got a great engine because it's bombing along and it, they manage to catch the train and they get Carl Morden out with the eggs, but then the girl comes out and she shoots the two cowboy guys rather conveniently, but Harry grabs hold of Carl Morden and the eggs so that they can't take them to Moscow and the train takes off, but Carl Morden gets away with the eggs and he runs after the train and the woman's on the back and he manages to give her the eggs, but instead of her bringing him on board, she kicks him back down into the snow. And Carl Morden's like real shocked because uh, he, he, he thought they had a deal and maybe that she even loved him, but obviously she don't. And she's like, sorry about that, wave goodbye. But they get back in the car again, which is this brilliant car because it's faster than a train on snow and ice and on bendy roads. But they chase this, uh, this, this uh, train but there's no chance, so they lose that. But meanwhile, the generals arrived magically as well from Texas, and now he's got an entire bloody army, and he's doing a kind of uh, Mussolini type of uh, speech to them, and they all get in these uh, sort of look like petrol tankers, gas tankers, and they set off across the ice, loaded up with weapons and hundreds of men and they're gonna the revolution's gonna start because the billion dollar brain said it's gonna start but um while they're all and they've got to go across the sea which is frozen but as they're doing that uh michael kane's magically caught up with them with carl malden in in the back seat and exactly how they're going to get the general's armored car out of the way with a little a little red, whatever it is they're driving, God knows. But while this is going on, Colonel Stock's in a control room and he's got all these pieces being moved around and he sends out the bombers 
and the bombers fly over and they bomb the army of the general and of course all the ice cracks which just goes to show you shouldn't really drive every vehicles over ice really above the sea should you especially if you're trying to invade someone um, and they've got bombers and they, they just bomb you and then all the convoy of these trucks and army vehicles all sink into the ice and Carl Morden's been shot by the general's armoured car but uh, Harry Palmer survived and the car goes in the ice but Harry manages to roll to one side and they all the general and his army all drown and Colonel Stock's like yeah because you're stupid and he's right really the general was a bit stupid so Harry's standing there on the ice and then a helicopter comes down this Colonel Stock and he's got the girl with him and he's got the package with the eggs and uh, he says, here yeah, Harry, you can have them. We don't want them, they're a bit primitive for us. We've got our own kind of uh, viruses that are much more advanced than these. Take them back to Colonel Ross and he's ho, ho, ho. He's still very affable and says, yeah, the general is a stupid man, very brave. In right times, maybe you need men like this, but in times as we have them now, it's just stupid. So... Harry returns back to London with the case with the flask and the eggs in it. But Colonel Ross is really pleased to see him, but when they open when he opens the package, what's inside? Chicks. Brilliant. What a brilliant ending to a very silly, silly movie. That kind of spoils the Harry Palmer trilogy, I think. The music in this film is terrible as well. The first two films, it's pretty good, but it, the last film, the music is really over the top and it, it builds up when nothing is happening and it just annoys the hell out of you. It's not a very good movie. I mean, Kane's fine, he, he sort of plays it straight, but it loses all sense of what it was supposed to be or what it... what well of what the first two films were and I never read Len Dayton's books but um, I don't think the third movie does anyone justice whatsoever and uh, it's worth watching for a kind of you know if you're interested in Harry Palmer and stuff it's worth watching as a bit of a freak but uh, not a great movie so anyway that concludes my reviews of the Harry Palmer trilogy there are two more films, as I said at the beginning, later. Maybe I'll review them, maybe not. I've got other things to review and do. And uh, kind of did this one for me old man, who was a big fan of Michael Caine and especially Harry Palmer, who was probably my, who my dad would love to have been. Maybe not in the third film, but in the first two. OK, well, thanks for watching and thanks for listening. And... Uh, Sorry if there's background noise. Uh, I, I live on a tropical island in the middle of nowhere and uh, it's very noisy here, strangely. So, there you go. You can't... Paradise is not always what it uh, is cracked up to be. I'm doing my best and uh, I'll see you about.